All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. We're going to start out by doing a, li a little introduction of who we are, where we work. Um, so I'll go first. My name is Morgan Taddeo. I am the public health specialist at East Hill Medical Center. All right. My name is Jane Oliver. I'm a senior at Auburn High School. And next year, I'll be attending the University of Rochester. Hey. Uh, my name is Jessica Schneider. I'm the front office manager here at the Hilton Garden Inn. My name is Mallory Murtari. I am a service coordinator for two Medicaid waiver programs, um, people with traumatic brain injuries and nursing home transition and diversion waivers. And good morning. I'm Rob Otterstadter. I am the owner and chief operating officer at Octane Social House. All right, so that is our group. So we did our research on food insecurity in Cuba County. Um, what we've done is our project goal, which we'll dive into a little bit later, was to create a multicultural meal plan that supports the people in our county who are food insecure. We'll start this presentation off with some definitions and some statistics. All right, so what is food insecurity? A general definition. So the state of being without reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable nutritious food. So food insecurity can have some serious impacts on people. For children, that could affect them in their schooling. It could lead to a lack of focus, a lack of attention. And for adults, this can lead to you know, lower producti productivity in the workplace. And then for children and adults alike, food insecurity can lead to both physical health and mental health related issues. So I found this quote online and I thought this was really powerful. It says, no family should have to decide between buying groceries or paying for rent. No senior should have to choose between food and medicine. And no parent should have to skip a meal in order for their child to eat. So here are some local statistics. We'll start off with Cuba County. So according to feedingamerica.org, which is the nation's largest domestic hunger relief organization, 8,300 people in Cuba County are currently food insecure. And then in Central New York as a whole, one in eight people are food insecure. 29% of emergency food recipients are children under the age of 18, with 7% being between ages zero and five. So these numbers talk. These really show you that this is a prevalent issue. This is real, this is raw, and this is occurring right here in Cuba County in Central New York. Don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll dive into SNAP a little bit later. Rob has a lot of really great information regarding SNAP, but just a general definition as to what SNAP is. It's a federally funded program administered here in Cuba County by the Cuba County Human Services Department for the United States Department of Agriculture. So foods, the food stamps program is now referred to as SNAP. Um, SNAP, what it does is it assists low income households to purchase nutritious food at authorized grocery stores, now farmers markets and other um, re retailers. So individuals must apply for this program and provide all the required documentation, which we'll go over some of that required documentation a little bit later. And then if approved, recipients receive an electronic benefit card, which is referred to as an EBT card. So it looks much like a debit card. So it's very discreet. It's not you know, holding up a line, handing out coupons, um, any of that. So the SNAP benefit is provided monthly directly onto that EBT card. And the amount of SNAP benefit is based on household size, income and other factors, which Rob will then chat about later on. So project introduction. Our group has decided to create a low cost multicultural meal plan that falls within a SNAP budget. Our idea is to create a cookbook. So the cookbook outline, what we'd like for this cookbook to be compromised of is a delicious, sweet to the soul and healthy to the bones recipes. And then a huge special thanks to our Robert, who I've referred to a few times. Um, he has wonderful culinary insight that really plays into the recipes that we have to share. So we'll also include some tips and tricks for making the most of your grocery budget, grocery budget 
And then a list of all operating food pantries in Cuba County. There are a lot. Um, a list of local farmers markets, and then some community programs that will aid with food education. All right. All right. So uh, if, if each of you, I've, I've passed out a, a little handout for you uh, that helps you understand how it is that we came to uh, the recipes. And it does help that I own a restaurant. It helps that I'm married to a chef uh, who is phenomenal at what she does. And so the, the two of us sat down and we spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out where, how, how do we how do we come to this? So first thing we uh, we looked at was so what's the budget? Uh, according to the USDA's uh, SNAP website, the average SNAP recipient or the benefit per person was one hundred and twenty five dollars a month, which works out to be one dollar and thirty nine cents per person per meal. When my wife and I first saw that, we were shocked. Um, I never really thought about my food broken down to per person per meal before. I know when I go out to a restaurant uh, with my family, it typically is somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to $12 per person at an inexpensive restaurant. Even going to somewhere like McDonald's, uh, my, my kids love McDonald's, I, I don't, but my kids do. Um, <laughs> a happy meal that my children will split uh, because they're one and three. Uh, I'm not making them split, but uh, at any rate, <laughs> that meal will cost me about $7. Okay, so even McDonald's is, is considerably more than $1.39 per person. We also have to look at nutrition guidelines because if we're gonna create menus, uh, I, I want, we wanted to make sure that they were nutritionally sound. I know when I worked down in Washington, D.C., uh, for a school district down there, we had a lot of, a, a lot of children that came to our school that to, were, their families were recipients of SNAP benefits, and they would stop at 7-Eleven on the way in and pick up a two-liter bottle of soda and a bag of chips, and that was their lunch. And we didn't want to do that either. So according to the... Uh, uh, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020 through 2025, uh, a healthy eating plan emphasizes fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, includes a variety of protein foods such as seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, legumes, soy products, nuts, seeds, is low in saturated fats, trans fats, cholesterol, sodium, uh, and added sugars, stays within daily calorie needs, uh, which is typically between 2,000 and 2,500, um, 2,000 for women, 2,500 for men. And we also began looking at uh, what I remember from school is the USDA's pyramid, which has been changed. That is now the MyPlate, and it's represented as a, a pie chart, essentially, uh, where 40% are vegetables, 30% are grains, 20% is protein, 10% is fruit. And then there's a small circle outside of the plate that represents dairy, which, which they re uh, recommend between five and 10%. Every recipe uh, that we created meets every USDA and CDC general nutrition guideline. That was very important to us. In addition, we looked at using SNAP benefits to help SNAP recipients stock their kitchen over time for simple meals. Having a well-stocked kitchen makes meal planning easier. Um, and we've created a basic food checklist to help stock a home pantry, refrigerator, and freezer with simple, inexpensive, and nutritional foods that can help bolster the, uh, the ultimate recipes. Now, in addition uh, to that, the, the company that I own, Octane Social House, is, de it is developing right now and will roll out in June a once a month class for SNAP recipients to learn how to create a multicultural weekly menu that meets budgetary requirements at $1.39 per person uh, that meets the USDA nutritional guidelines. So if you take a look up on the, up on the board, uh, the first recipe was an orzo cranberry salad. Again, we, we tried to use as much 
local as we could as well. But again, going back to this idea of uh, stocking your pantry. Uh, Orzo, you can buy a box of it very inexpensively. Uh, there, there are a variety of different types of, of Orzo, but uh, some of the more nutritional Orzo um, is still within, within the budget. And that box of Orzo will last far beyond this one recipe. So that goes into the pantry. Same with the dried cranberries. Uh, the celery, you'll, you will notice that uh, there's an awful lot of reuse of some of the foods. Uh, the celery, you, you get a whole bunch of it fairly inexpensive. The same with mayonnaise. Uh, and then curry powder. Again, you, we're, not, we're not buying teaspoons of these, of these items. We're buying a box or a, a handle of, of these uh, that can be used further down the road. Uh, chicken with bow tie pasta, um, pound of chicken. And again, we're not talking about you know, the, um, the cheapest grocery store chicken. We're talking about actually uh, going to lo local uh, farms or going to the farmer's markets, uh, which, which most of the farmer's markets have vendors that will accept the, uh, the EBT cards. Uh, if, if they don't, a lot of them have tokens uh, that you can uh, purchase. Um, again, using fresh fruits uh, or vegetables in this case, uh, green, yellow, red peppers, um, onions, garlic, clo uh, the uh, Italian seasoning, uh, salt, pepper. Again, these, these things that are going to be important to stock in your pantry. And uh, sausage and beef with tomato sauce. Um, looking at, again, going to local vendors uh, with, uh, with vegetables. So didn't skimp anywhere on the quality of food or uh, in fact, didn't skimp on the quantity of food. Uh, the, uh, the, the servings on this, we, we figured it out that uh, the average, what the average serving would be. And then we multiplied that times 1.5 so that it would be a large enough serving that uh, each person could eat a little bit more than uh, they, uh, might re than the recipe might recommend. Can we continue? Yeah. So uh, the last one is a, uh, a breakfast quiche, uh, and uh, again, I don't know that, and, and I and I don't mean this in any sort of offensive way, but and most of the SNAP benefit recipients that I've that I've spoken with at the shop. Uh, I don't think they think quiche is within their budgetary uh, constraints. And quiche, by the way, is, is really nothing more than egg pie. Um, and uh, uh, this one here, you know, local eggs, minced onion, salt, pepper, sausage, uh, cheddar cheese. And uh, you know, most of these can be, can be uh, ready to go in under an hour. Okay, so I um, kind of researched food pantries in Cayuga County. Um, I actually got this list from the Office of the Aging website, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, so I can't take the credit, but Auburn, does, just Auburn alone has five um, different places to get foods. And then if you go to the next slide, Morgan, there's just, I just listed the rest, which kind of really cover a good portion of of Hewitt County, you see Weedsport has one, Port Byron, Troop, Cato, and then there's the, um, on the next slide, then there's just more, the more. Fairhaven, Moravia, Union Springs, King Ferry, so I believe that's about 13 in Hewitt County, which is really a good amount. Um, I think our specific, talking about the food and the cookbook, we're kind of talking more on a micro level as a, compared to the macro community level. You know, we want to see this. Um, I think we're all, you know, we're all like destined to have this on, you know, this cookbook on someone's kitchen counter cooking. Um, as someone that doesn't cook, I would love this. Um, and as Rob, I think Rob mentioned a lot of like the orzo and the, you know, the rice, the bow ties. A lot of that is, I guess, typical um, what you would see in a box from the food pantry. Um, and someone, you know, that doesn't cook or doesn't, you know, is educated in food like myself would be overwhelmed, you know, and like, what do you do with this? You know, how do you make a healthy, good meal? Um, 
And I know we'll talk a little bit more about farmers market, which also um, accepts, you know, SNAP. So um, like with the recipes, I guess, you know, a lot of this stuff does come through, can come through food pantries. Um, so in my research, I guess like King Fairy has a really good Facebook page. Um, Salvation Army has a Facebook page. There are several different Facebook pages that announces, um, you know, when they do like produce giveaway, um, they do, they have like specific, like the King Fairy I know um, has a list of several different foods and they literally check what they have available. Um, and on this website, actually on this list from the Office of Aging has um, like of course their hours and pickup directions, some of them in, in now because of COVID I'm sure, but um, has like emergency drop-offs, especially for seniors, um, which makes me also think about meals on wheels, but I can go on and on about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's available and I think this, and of course we would put a list, of, we would put this list in, um, our cookbook as well. So it's there. I think a lot of the, it, it's kind of a simple concept for us, but talking about food insecurity, talking also about resource insecurity, you know, just having access to the internet or a computer or, you know, a printer to print this off or somehow to refer, you know, someone to these food pantries or being on Facebook and seeing that um, there's also friends and family that post a lot on Facebook um, of what they have available. You know, they often have a, um, a plenty of like a certain food group, I guess, and you really just have to pick it up. Um, again, I thought about, of course, the transportation, which is an issue, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other issue that um, I didn't tackle. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just, that's a little bit about the food pantries. There are, like I said, there are several for Cuba County. Um, and they, they really post, they're out there. It's just kind of about getting the people that need this, you know, into the home, which I think the cookbook obviously is very helpful because a lot of those dry ingredients, um, you know, that are in the recipes are in, are often in the boxes that come with, um, that. So we thought the cookbook obviously was a good idea to, you know, kind of, help along and aid someone to actually make these meals, um, you know, so all this can come to fruition. And for the record, early on, uh, the, the uh, last fall, the school was handing out uh, or had food available uh, to folks to pick up. And I assisted with that and I actually picked up food to deliver to families, went through the box to find out what's in the box on a regular basis. Uh, and, and so we started uh, with with that knowledge as well. And then uh, I will also share that uh, throughout the process, uh, we, my, my family and I ate this, uh, ate every one of the recipes and then uh, played with some others as well. And very tasty, very tasty. Um, another thing that I think is important to highlight too is that as a result of the pandemic, food pantries, soup kitchens, um, which had limited access. Really, there was a lot of light shown on these places because people, you know, were running into this issue where there were losses of jobs, family members were coming down ill. There was a lack of food and that lack of security. So the face of food insecurity has drastically changed and there really is no face of food insecurity. Um, just because somebody may be walking around with luxurious belongings does not mean that, you know, behind closed doors, they're in tears, concerned about how they can provide for their family. So I think this list is, you know, a wonderful start to show where people in our community can go. Especially, sorry, sorry, um, especially, I mean, a lot of these places are churches um, and, you know, people generally, especially now in a pandemic, I mean, people want to help, you know, so I, I feel like if someone calls and like, you know, I really can't get this, because some of these, because again, on the Office of Aging website, this list does have like, you know, we will deliver or, you know, they're for pickup, they will, you know, be accommodated. And like I said, like the social media and the Facebook, just getting it out there and just, you know, advertising that they have this and then really just kind of have to pick it up and it's not really, you know, this huge, 
this huge deal, I think I guess like it used to be, or you know, it's just it's just easier. And we do we do have a lot of resources in Keogh County. Um, it's really just about getting the information and the resources to the people that need it. Uh, so to add on to Mallory's resources of finding food at no cost, the really great way of finding food at a low cost would be by going to a farmer's market. So there are thousands of farmer's markets across the country that accept SNAP as a benefit, as well as the farmer's market nutrition programs for people using WIC, which is women, infants, and children, and for seniors. And locally, the Auburn Farmers Co-op Market here on State Street, they do accept SNAP and some of the individual vendors accept the other two programs that I mentioned. And going back to that Alice presentation, not everyone that is food insecure actually qualifies for SNAP. So farmers markets are still a really great budget-friendly way to get those ingredients for the recipes that we offer and that's because on average uh, farmers markets are about 20 percent less expensive for produce than going to a grocery store so in either case it is a definite good way uh, to fight against food insecurity by using a farmers market and including farmers markets as a resource in our cookbook actually serves two purposes so first it connects families with potential places to shop inexpensively for ingredients and second, it helps to support our local farm economy. So a farmer who sells grocery, sells two grocery stores, they get about 20 cents per dollar on those food items. And when they sell directly to a consumer through these farmer's markets, they get up to 90% when you take in the like, overhead costs for their food. Um, and then, um, here on the slide, we just have a small sampling of the available markets that are in the area. And I took most of these from the tourism website. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on the actual cookbook, it will have a complete list of all markets in the county that are open, their contact information, as well as whether or not they accept SNAP benefits or the other two federal programs. And there will be a nice Q County map as a visual with each location pinned just to get a good visual representation of that. And pass on to Jane who will tell us how everything will come to fruition. Yeah, so you're probably all thinking this is such an amazing idea how this has become a reality. Well, we're going to need um, funding mostly from the community. When we were like, thinking of ideas of who could help us, we were thinking a lot of like restaurants, or not restaurants, grocery stores like Wegmans, all of these. Uh, food pantries, some local restaurants like Octane Social House, that would help um, allow us to fund that goes into printing. We're hoping that we would partner with a local US, US, UPS store and we would distribute this all throughout the community. It would be at food pantries, hopefully at restaurants. We hope that we can distribute it for free for attendees at the workshop at Octane Social House. Um, really just getting it everywhere to everyone who possibly could need it and really easy access. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. So our future plans. Once this gets um, brought out into the community, we hope that it can lead to something bigger. You know, as soon as like, at a larger time plan, we have more time to really evolve the project into something more like a large scale, large scale education effort to really make sure everyone knows that you can make healthy meals for yourself. There are access to different places where you can access affordable food for yourself. And really, Morgan made this cool graphic of what it means to us. I feel like a lot of us, at some point in our life, we've seen someone deal with food insecurity or we've dealt with it ourselves. I know growing up, you know, I'm from a family with divorced parents. My mom used food stamps when I was younger. So I did see it. I remember being in line. Actually, one of like the memories I had was a person in front of us, a man with his children, and he had his food stamps and he didn't have enough to get all the groceries that he had when he was trying to check out. And it's just, you really see that it affects everyone in the community some way, some, some time in their life. And I think this act, this really, this cookbook with all these resources in it can really help this problem. Absolutely. 
And I think too, um, this has been such a fantastic group to work with because we can all bring in some personal experience that you know drives us and motivates mm -hmm. us to continue pursuing this after the class. Um, we've all agreed that we wanna work with one another to bring this cookbook to fruition, to print it, to join Rob in his cooking sessions at Octane. So if we wanna go around and share some personal experience, I don't know what that, okay. So personally for me, I began working for East Hill Medical Center in June of 2020. So right in the midst of the pandemic and an initiative that we started was, I was to build a food insecurity screening for our providers and nurses to conduct during assessments and well visits with patients. So what this was, was a series of two questions really just asking, you know, did they have food sources? Did they have the accessibility? Were they able to provide for themselves and their families? And after asking these questions, if you know a patient did prove to be food insecure, they would be referred on to me. And then I would be making that call to the patient to see if they'd be comfortable being connected to the Food Bank of Central New York, who is wonderful, by the way. Shout out to Angela, she is great. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of phone calls where, you know, I, I had a parent answer the phone. And they start out the conversation a little bit offended that, you know, I call regarding food insecurity. It can be a tough topic to approach somebody about. And after a few minutes in the phone call, I did have a few people break down on the phone and be incredibly thankful for the call and the connection. And, you know, hanging up after those phone calls, you really think about, you know, you were a person in that process to help connect somebody to provide for themselves and their families. And it really hits home, you know? And I think it's such a wonderful thing that, you know, our community is so involved with helping one another. And I'm really, yeah, looking forward to having this be another stepping stone to help people and to combat food insecurity. Um, so as Jane, I also grew up using SNAP benefits back when it was the food stamps, actual voucher coupons. Um, my dad is on disability, so it was pretty much my whole childhood. Um, and we didn't always have nutritious meals. It was a lot of uh, lean cuisine, the kid cuisine, little TV dinners and banquets. Um, banquet meals, not... <laughs> um, and so for me, I connected this project because I know what it's like to experience it and not get that kind of healthy eating, not always having meals. So if I can do something to help another family, you know, ensure that they are, you know, feed, feeding everyone nutritiously so that the children can thrive, adults can thrive and not stress out, then that is something that I would like to do. My thoughts are from first from professional experience. Um, I do work with people with disabilities, and you know, a lot of times they get these boxes and they just have no idea what you know what they can make out of it. What can you know what meals or what can happen from just a box of <laughs> random, honestly, some random food. Um, so I just really liked this the idea of the cookbook, and Rob just worked really hard on making it. You know, I think just accessible and, you know, not that hard for people like us that don't cook and have no idea <laughs> and don't want to cook. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my, like, thinking and my process of when we were working on this is, you know, who the people that I can help, um, you know, and the, the overwhelmed single mom, you know, and they only have a couple things in the pantry, but, you know, you really can make um, you know, a meal that can last, that can last for your family, maybe even, you know, one or two meals with leftovers. Um, so that was important to me. So I thought that was really cool that we did that, so. So, <clears throat> I couldn't have picked a worse time to open a restaurant. <laughs> I'll start there. Um, and going through this process was, was certainly helpful. Um, 
when you take your, so I'm, I'm retired, I'm a retired police commander. I took my retirement and dumped it into a dream. My, my wife is a chef. Uh, I have run a variety of different social programs uh, for the sheriff's office out in Colorado where I worked, uh, for the school district that I worked in DC. And so I thought, this, what, what a great opportunity to take my wife's talents and my talents, put them together and live happily ever after. Four years of work to put Octane Social House together. I began the build out in January of 2020 with the anticipation of opening on the 26th of March, 2020. The 12th of March, they're about the world changed. My contractors walked off the job. When they were allowed to come back on the 18th of May in 2020, my contractors contacted me and said, my guys are making more on unemployment than they are working for me. And they're not interested in coming back to work. I did the majority of the build out, but the city would not allow me to do the electrical, the plumbing, or the HVAC. So I did all that I could, got ready for my contractors to eventually return. We opened up on the 24th of August, 2020, under a temporary certificate of occupancy. And it's been hard. Um, we, struggle to get customers through our door every single day, still right now. So when we took on this task, uh, and by the way, if, if I qualified, I would, uh, I would meet the Alice requirement uh, currently. Um, my wife and I have paid ourselves exactly twice in nine months. We put in 160 hours-ish a week, every two weeks. My last paycheck that I personally received was for five hours of my time and five hours of my wife's time. And it's interesting because when folks come to us, they assume, oh, you own a restaurant, you guys must be loaded. We're not. Um, we eat probably at the dollar thirty-nine mark often. And so putting this together um, was also helpful for us. And we are hopeful that we make it through the pandemic. I know that things begin to open up considerably on the 19th, but that also means that my rent it, it goes up to its, its full amount um, and a variety of other things that come along with that. So I still don't know uh, if, if we'll be able to pay ourselves. We don't qualify for unemployment because we own a business. Uh, so we didn't get any unemployment last year. Um, so to make ends meet, sometimes I drive Uber and a variety of other things uh, just to keep my lights on. Um, so this was an eye-opening experience for me, it was helpful. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes, as was mentioned earlier, you know, we don't know who's living at what point. Um, and so the struggle is real. And if we can do something to help other people in that situation, we'd like to. Any questions for Mr. Alice? Um, yeah, I have, I guess, a comment and a question. One is that was an excellent presentation. That was wonderful. And um, I think what you guys are doing with the cookbook in general is awesome. But what a great idea to put the resources right in it, because I think that a lot of us just think, like, okay, if I'm going to call the, the food pantry, I'm just going to pick up my phone and look up the number and call. But you're absolutely right that not everybody has those resources. So I just think that is, like, a phenomenal idea. Um, but one question I have is about these, these classes that you're considering doing at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, I, I know one thing you guys talk about and, and that you guys have stressed so far is now it's on, um, now the methods are on cards, so it's a little more discreet. If, if you want to hold these, um, these cooking classes, how do you plan to present to the community or advertise it in a way that's not going to make people possibly embarrassed to, to want to attend? So we plan on reaching out to the different organizations that help align folks with SNAP. Okay, and you advertise to them and they'll- Correct. I got you. Correct. There's no sense just advertising to the general public okay. because a lot of the general public isn't receiving SNAP benefits and, and we so want to make sure we want to make sure we're targeting the folks that need it. Gotcha. Okay. Robbie? Hi. <laughs> well, I think you guys, ladies and gentlemen, did a very fantastic job. Um, I guess uh, the first question I got are the recipes that you made gluten free. So these particular recipes, we did not take into consideration uh, the special dietary needs of some people. We will take those into consideration. So the intention of the, the class that I mentioned here um, is to help people create their own menus uh, with all of the different specialty menus that are required of different people, different restaurants and so on. It's very hard um, to hit vegan and gluten-free and dairy-free and soy-free and corn-free and all those, all those different things that are out there when they come to us and they say, we need to do something that is gluten-free. We can help them with those resources to create menus for themselves that are in fact uh, meeting the requirements of their own individual uh, dietary needs. Um, do you know how much it would cost to make one of these cookbooks? That you have right now or, or whatnot as a kickoff? So, we don't necessarily know the cost of the full completion of the cookbook. Um, that's something that we've really got to sit down and dissect and diagnose together. We are hoping that we can find people in the community to help fund us and, you know, bring those funds together to create and bring this cookbook to fruition, but we're really uncertain of the cost at hand at this time but you all will be the first to know, um, you know, the process and when things are rolling out, I think it'd be great if we could get one to each of you to maybe bring to your workplace or to advertise on social media and, you know, help us launch this project. I guess the reason that I ask is, of course, I'm always looking at what I do for a living and maybe there's a way that we can partner. We have some community community impact dollars that we could use to probably fund a certain portion, if not all, depending on the cost of what the what the book would be, you know, on the three pages right now or, or, or you know. So we have eight recipes drafted up right now. Um, we will have a few pages designated Farm, to yeah. farmers, farmers markets, markets and the food pantries. Yep. Um, but I'd like to include one page for folks to be able to, once they understand these recipes, to be able to help create their own, so that even if they can't come to one of the classes that we're offering at Octane, uh, that they will be able to create their own uh, budget-friendly, multicultural recipe. Why can you get me one of the copies? <laughs> so as soon as we, as soon as we have a, a, a draft. And that the draft is in the works at this moment, um, you know, so we will keep you posted. Do you have a time frame? I'd like to say that we could begin rolling this out, say all continues to go well and COVID restrictions continue to lift, um, maybe by the fall. I think that'd be great because farmers markets will be mm -hmm. up and going. Um, so I think that'd be a really great time to launch. The first class will be the third uh, June, or excuse me, the third Saturday in June. Well, I guess what I mean is for the draft to be done so I can so I can see it and present it to the steering committee that I report to and, and somehow form it in a way that we can get two avenues. 
we can certainly get a mock up put together oh, yeah. with, with preliminary costs. I don't anticipate it, it, it will cost that much. Yeah, mock up would be good, but cost doesn't matter. We can probably figure that out on our own. Okay. All right. Thanks, Wally. So, what would be the time frame on that? Um, Let's say July. I, I was going to say, I, 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 I bet we can do it by early July. July. Let's talk to my boss, see if I can do it. Dan? Uh, so, I have two questions. One, uh, Morgan, with the 8,300 individuals that are food insecure, what year was that from? That was from 2019, I believe. Okay. Yep. It's so hard when they release data, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. right. a year later coming out. So. Okay. And then, um, and, and we're sure that those numbers have increased over time. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Right. Um, in the recipe, um, Rob, is there, or have you any thought to substitutions that can be made? Certainly. Um, or suggested substitutions, because I'm thinking about the food pantries and one of the um, things that often happens to them is um, they, they get out of something. Or they get too much of something from the USDA. So, example, late 2019, there must have been a surplus of dry beans, and the government bought a bunch. And so, food, the food banks here were like, they get stacked up to here and nobody knew what to do with dry beans. So, um, you know, just thinking about that because that, that food, um, food pantries are an important supplement for SNAP recipients uh, beyond what they can uh, purchase at the grocery store or farmer's market. It's actually, sorry, I know that was directed to you, but really quickly, that's actually a good question slash comment um, because I now follow like all of the um, food pantries. Um, so that maybe is something that Rob and I could, you know, if I'm seeing a lot of beans or something, you know, maybe we, Rob and I could discuss that for like the monthly, the monthly um, cooking classes, you know, at, you know, hey, hey, can we work, can we work in beans this month, you know, so because there are a lot, and let's try to work on, you know, cooking something with beans. So okay. that is something that we can kind of collaborate on and actually use those, those ingredients that there are, because there are a lot of random things. And like I said, I keep giving myself an example, but I don't know what to do with them either. So maybe, you know, maybe we could use them. <laughs> or I, I also thought of the cookbook maybe can have, you know, so we could add pages, you know, as the monthly, amount, you know, the sheet of whatever they cook at the monthly, um, you know, the monthly class to add it to the cookbook for, you know, for a reference. And certainly an option for adding in might be one of the small three ring binders where yeah, we yeah. have additional inserts that can be put in, but sort of an anecdotal story, uh, back last fall when I was delivering food to families nearby that needed it from the school, uh, and I don't, I don't know if anybody went out to the schools to see the long lines of cars out in the Auburn High School parking lot, but it was typically five to seven full length uh, lines of cars uh, lined up to, to pick up a box of food. And I would typically get there in the morning, I'd load uh, between five and 10 boxes into the back of my pickup uh, to deliver to, to different families. And then I would help deliver that, uh, that food uh, to, to uh, uh, get rid of the line, to get the line down. But there was one, oh gosh, at least a month, and it was done every Friday. Uh, uh, and there was one month that in every box was two bags of taco meat. And taco meat is sort of interesting. Um, and, and I mean that in the, in the nicest way. Um, <laughs> it's not your typical ground beef like an E20 mix. Um, it was, they were actually this particular batch of taco meat that was that was delivered didn't actually meet USDA guidelines. It was seventeen percent beef, and so Taco Bell. This is a true story. Taco Bell um, requires uh, that they have twenty percent beef in their tacos. Think about that. Twenty percent beef. Not it's not eighty percent beef and twenty percent fat. It's twenty percent beef. And this didn't even meet Taco Bell standards because it was 17% beef. So 
Uh, and you know, those are those are some of the challenges that, that, that sometimes you know, we have to deal with. And so, what do you do with this taco meat um, that is 17% beef, and still, you know, we want it to, to meet some sort of nutritional requirements? So, Claire. Um, when this does come to fruition, what distribution avenues? You said you would like, give them out at pantries, or what was your thought? We so want them to be available at pantries. Hopefully, places like you know um, agencies like CAP, um, Q account, you know, Q account, I mean, there's several not profit or so just several agencies that deal with people. Would you put them out for sale to so like this is something where like I would buy one or you know pay one for this one I like. Books, but if you had like a buy one and give one program kind of thing to help raise your funds, yeah, that's an idea as well. And everybody, thank you for you know contributing to ideas. You know, this is a growing idea, and yeah, I love that. I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, kind of the flip side of that, um, if the cookbook is a Small enough cookbook, meaning there's 10 pages mm -hmm. or something like that. Have you considered a lower cost option, like literally copying it and stapling? And it's not what we think of as far as binding and all of that, but that's really where a lot of the cost is. But you're thinking of if it's a thicker document, yeah, you, you need something a little more for you to hold it together. But if, if I don't know if they're small, like focus things where it's like okay here's five mils for this or ten mils for that i, I don't know if that that's a thought either just throwing it out there because i mean I, I think the more this can get out yeah this is awesome thank you yeah we really have to dive into what we want our presentation to look like i personally want it to be something that you know somebody would want out on their kitchen counter and something physically appealing to look at. Um, but I agree with you, it would get out a lot quicker if you were to compile some papers, slap a staple on it. Um, but yeah, we really want to be diving into that soon. Um, just to consider as you're growing this, uh, a digital aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I love my Wegmans app, you know, and to think how this can evolve and continue to grow recipes whether it's creating a website where someone can access it from their phone or actually working with the Department of Social Services or the food bank to actually create an app where food pantries, like whatever box they're giving out that month, can create customized like recipes. So like having the tangible cookbook is a wonderful idea, but it can be a digital component, mm -hmm. which would be a cheaper um, option as you move forward. And it might open up other funding opportunities that you try to grow this larger because you can tap into state and federal dollars. That's yeah, one, those, are, sure. those are the ideas my, my, my wife had raised with, with me uh, as we were starting this process and also op providing an opportunity for people to add recipes yeah. uh, uh, through an online forum of some sort uh, and, and even, even possibly uh, make an app available. Yeah, I can see it like at Department of Social Services when you're applying for SNAP benefits being able to download yeah. or have the codes. Mm -hmm. It could be also um, an events calendar where it's reminding people of the upcoming uh, classes at Octi and Social Health um, as you guys have all this. I think definitely limited ingredients too, so it's not you know super overwhelming. So so it's so they're all doable as well as as nutritious as possible and you know as budget friendly as possible. Well it's really our goal. How many pages would it be kickoff? <laughs> I, 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 would, I would guess somewhere in the 12 to 14 page range. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, Aaron. No, it's okay. I want to hear anyone online if you have any questions or comments. Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you guys did an excellent job. Thank you very much.